Hello everyone, and thank you for joining me on this session today, through which we'll touch on a frequently asked question. What are get branching strategies? What do we mean by branching strategies? What do we mean by multi-environments? How can I make sure that my code is organized and structured when it is transferred between different environments and different branches? And the most important, how can I make sure that the latest and the healthiest copy of my code is deployed to production? We'll try to answer some of these questions in our session. My name is Samer Akub. I'm a Senior Alliances and Channel Solutions Architect with GitLab. In our agenda today, we'll touch on these different points. First, we'll discuss the different branching strategies, and we'll see what are the differences between these branching strategies and when to use what. Second, we'll see how to implement properly GitLab flow branching strategy. And third, we'll see how to implement segregation of duties between branches, tags, variables, and environments, a very important practice to master. And last but definitely not least, the time will come for what is the difference question. Cool. I hope you are excited as much as I am. So what do we mean by branching strategies? A branching strategy is basically a set of rules and conventions teams would follow when they create and manage branches in a Git repository. Simple, right? These conventions were created to help teams collaborate and work together throughout the software development lifecycle. Today in the market, the three most common or most popular branching strategies are Git Flow, GitHub Flow, and GitLab Flow. What are the key differences between them and when to use what? Let us dive into each of them. So the first branching strategy here with us is Git Flow. Simply, Git flow model or branching strategy recommends two main long lived branches, develop and main. Development primarily happens or occurs in the develop branch, proceeds to the release branch, and ultimately merges into the main branch. The development on the develop branch is done by creating feature branches out of that develop branch that the feature is developed on that feature branch and then merged back into the develop branch. Once ready, a release branch is created from that develop branch. This thing is done on that release branch. If anything wrong is found, a hotfix branch is created from that release branch. The hotfix is tested and merged into the release branch and then backward merged into the develop branch. Remember, other features would have been or can, could have been developed as well on the develop branch Meanwhile, we are doing this hotfix on the release branch. Once the release branch is ready, it is merged into the master branch. Again, this thing is done on the master branch once it is merged. If there are any issues there, hotfixes branches are created again from the master branch and these issues are fixed. Then these hotfixes are merged into the develop backward into the release and develop branch. Cool. Now, this branching strategy actually introduces some key challenges. The first one is its lack of support for continuous integration. As you can see, as we are jumping between these different branches, this is not a suitable structure for an organization that is looking to do multiple, maybe deployments a day or a, or a week to the production environment. Because we keep on jumping between or doing testing on two different branches. Also, at some point, as you can see, that easily we can lose the track of where is the latest copy of my code. As I said before, while I'm doing hotfixes on the release branch, the developers may, may have been, and most probably they are, working on the develop branch, creating new features and merging that against that develop branch. Now, when I bring my hotfix from the release branch, isn't there a chance that this hotfix will override the changes the developer has done or at least contradict with them and create new issues? Same applies for the hotfixes coming from the master branch to the develop, develop branch. The other thing, simply, there is an overhead here. 
Developers must use the developer branch to do their development. Guess what? Developers are used to use the main or the default branch to their to use to, to do their development. This is a behavioral change, which can be a challenging thing, especially for experienced or long-term developers. Third one, complexity. Gitflow introduces several long-term branches. Develop master feature release hotfixes. Yes, I said earlier that the, fe the features and the release and hotfixes are supposed to be short-lived lived branches. But that really depends on the amount of changes or how big are the changes in these branches. A hotfix on a release branch could, have, could be a, a long-lived branch if it takes longer time to be developed. Why? The more time it takes, the more diverse, the more diversified it will be from the original developed branch. Same applies for the hotfixes coming from the master branch. All of this increases the overhead for merging these different branches and increasing the chance for conflicts between the changes coming from these hotfixes or merges into the different branches. This is overall again leads us to the same conclusion. This is not the best choice for organizations that want to implement a proper CICD or CD at least practice. Can be a good choice for organizations that have a very strict long-term release cycle. For example, I'm an or I am an organization that I don't care about CICD. I don't want to go to production quickly. I don't care about how frequent I uh, release <clears throat> features to my customers. I'm happy to release something every maybe a couple of months, this can be a, a choice for them. The next branching strategy in our session today is the GitHub flow. GitHub flow, good news is, it is a much simpler branching strategy from the Git flow. All features are developed in feature branches and then everything is merged into the main branch. Much easier, right? Simply, I have one main branch or master branch, if you like, everything developed in feature branches and everything then is merged and tested against the main branch. Good, easier. Whenever I want to create a release, I just create a release or a tag, tag a release from there and I just deploy it to the, to the production. Cool. But this also introduces different set of challenges. First one, is lack of release and environment branches. Yes, we complained about them in first place, but we didn't really complain about their functionality. It's more of how I'm using them. In this instance, or in this branching strategy, we have removed them totally. We are just doing the testing or the integration testing in the main branch once everything is merged into the main branch. Now think of this, take it in this way. You are a developer, you are working on a feature. You will be very reluctant to merge your changes into the main branch un unless you are confident that your change is healthy and ready to be deployed to production because simply your change can go to the master branch, testing can be done there and then deployed to the, to the production. So managing and stabilizing code for production releases can be challenging especially for projects with strict release control requirements or fixed deployment windows. I want to deploy, deploy once a day or once a month, once a week, whatever. So your changes, either they are there to be deployed or they are not there, simply. Second one, feature branch accumulation. Again, you are working on a feature branch. You, are, you want to make sure this whole feature is done and ready before you merge it into the main branch. You can't go there with a half, half baked solution, really, because that at some point will be deployed to the production. So that would require you most of the time to take longer time to do the development of your feature, which means accumulate your code is accumulating, right? And large number of features branches are accumulating, which makes it necessary to carefully manage and coordinate their integration into the main branch. Trust me, it's not an easy thing when you have so many long-term branches and you want to merge all of them. Sometimes you may decide to drop some of the code and just get rid of it because it is becoming a nightmare to merge these code snippets together. Third one, 
lack of explicit testing stage. Now, maybe this is related to the first point as well, because in GitHub flow or GitHub flow, encourage testing directly in feature branches and deploying to production from there once they are merged into the main branch. This can be a drawback for projects that require a dedicated testing or staging environment. Most of the organizations I've experienced or worked for, they have these testing and staging environments. In my case here, or our case here with GitHub Flow, it is deploying everything directly from the main branch into the production branch. Not ideal for, by the way, before I move on, for that one, for lack of explicit testing, Trust me, none of us wants to know that something wrong is happening after my code is being integrated with other people's code when it is deployed to the production. I want to do that in my testing and staging environment. So that lack of environment, most of the time, is a killer point. The third one here is not ideal for all projects. I think you agree with me. GitHub flow may not be suitable for all types of projects, especially those with strict release management requirements or complex branching needs. But I don't think I need to explain it. It is very clear. And last but not least, overemphasis on deployment. The focus on continuous deployment might not align with projects where deployment is infrequent or where other concerns like code stability take precedence. Yes, it encouraged, I can't deny, it encouraged fast deployment to the production. Simply, feature branch, merge it, tested and, and deployed. Cool. But it comes on the account of code stability and proper code testing, especially when it comes to integration testing. So it's up to you what is more important. Maybe you are fine with releasing more products or more features quicker on the expense of having proper testing or proper uh, testing environments. It's up to you. I can't make recommendation, but it's up to you which one is more important, the healthy or the speed of the code. It's between these two. So the third branching strategy we have today is the GitLab flow. GitLab flow is a brisk and open-ended end-to-end workflow, which is very important differentiator. I'll show that to you in a second. Basically, it connects the whole development lifecycle all the way from creating a ticket until it is deployed to the production environment. GitLab flow spans across all the stages of, of the DevSecOps lifecycle, forming an efficient workflow with an inner feedback loop on the branch level and an outer feed, feedback loop across the whole lifecycle from the ticket creation until it is deployed. And again, I'll show that to you in a second. The other thing <clears throat> in GitLab flow, you have a dedicated environment and release branches. So yes, we are bringing them back. We complained about the structure of them in Git flow. We missed them in GitHub flow. In GitLab flow, we have a dedicated release and environment branches. So which means that I can run testing and staging in these environments. There are two variations of GitLab flow, environment and release, release branches environments for the different environments and then I create release branches when I am ready to go for a release and I tag that release to, to be deployed. Structured commits path. Basically, commits in GitLab flow move in one direction. Very important differentiator from the Git flow. In one direction, all the changes, all the development is done in the master branch using feature branches. I merge that into the master branch uh, I test on in my feature branches, which is the inner loop. Then I merge into the master branch. I test that there, and then I move on into the different environment branches. If anything wrong or found in these different branches, I try to avoid as much as possible applying my changes to these different environment branches. I, in a best practice way, I should create a feature branch again or a hotfix branch if you like again from the master branch apply my changes there test it and then merge it all the way across the different environment and release branches well-defined fixes structure basically for hotfixes as i said before i think this is this point relates to the point before hotfixes developers create feature branches and merge that into the main branch well-defined fixes 
structure. Basically, developers can create feature branches, merge and then merge that into the main or master branch, run my test both on the feature branch and in the master branch. If everything is fine, simply I can merge that feature branch. I can keep it and merge it into across all the different environments. So yes, I can do CI, CD. I can do daily releases quickly and safely. Minimize bug fixing on multiple branches. Basically by delay, delaying the creation of a release branch as much as possible. So that when working on a feature branch for an extended period, share your progress, progress with the team. Nothing would stop you from sharing the progress. You can open a draft merge request in GitLab. I can declare in GitLab flow. I can declare to the team members that I am working on this uh, change. I can merge my changes into the master, master branch gradually, right? And then only when I am ready, I would create a release branch so that I, as much as possible, avoid having to create hot fixes on that release branch. Now, at any time as well, I can do cherry picking between these different branches. I may not want to move everything between these different branches. So I can do cherry picking of what features I want to migrate or merge between master pre-production branches. Okay. Now, just to make it very clear, I decided to add this slide. There are two flavors of GitLab flow branching environments and releases. As you would expect, environment branches reflect the environments you have in your structure. Most of the time I see development, testing, pre-prod or staging, some, uh, some people call it, and a production environment. You can have the same thing. You can have the same structure here. It reflects your environment. There is no added complexity. The other thing is simply release branches. I create releases from the master branch upon need. And as I said before, I delay the creation of the releases. By the way, it is not an or. It doesn't have to be, I should say. It doesn't have to be an or decision between these two branching strategies. I can have still different environment branches. And then from the production branch, I may decide that, for example, I am sitting on release 14 today, but I want to make uh, my releases for release 14.1, 14.2, 14.3, I want to start working on them. So from that production branch, I may create different release branches and start working on them. And once I'm done with the release 14, I may merge all of them and start with the release 15 and I create different releases. Of course, every time you create a release, it is advisable, highly advisable, that you stamp it with a tag. You create a tag for that release which is think of it as a screenshot of the code that you are going to deploy. Okay, so this is the end-to-end -end GitLab on a very high level DevSecOps lifecycle. As I said before, in GitLab a platform, it, it covers the whole lifecycle for the application delivery, all the way from agile portfolio and project management, starting from creating epics, issues, tickets, assigning them against roadmaps, milestones. But without context switching, without leaving the, the, the tool, I can create merge requests and create branches, feature branches, if you like, and then start working on it. And this is what represents my inner feedback. So basically, I'm a developer. I am creating a branch from that development branch. I, I create my feature branch. I start doing the development and I'm able to run both functional and non-functional and testing and security testing capabilities against my copy of my feature branch, my copy of the code, which means that I get the feedback. I get the results from the testing just next to where I am doing the development. I can fix them. My mind is fresh. I know exactly what I've been doing. I am fixing them before I push that to be reviewed and merged into the, the master branch and from there to be propagated ac across the different environment and release branches. Now, once it is merged, this is where the outer feedback loop comes in the picture. As I said before, GitLab covers the whole life cycle of the DevSecOps, 
which means that I have a connected view all the way from the ticket that the developer or the business analyst created for a request or a function to be added to my tool all the way to the line of code that supports that ticket. So I'm able to do or to get a view and the feedback view on my code that's about to be deployed to the latest environment. Also, developers, actually not only developers, all the users in GitLab can collaborate, of course, based on their roles and responsibilities and their assigned roles, can collaborate on the code down to the line of code. So imagine how fantastic it is to be able to see the ticket and track it down, like on a high level, the ticket itself, and track it down to the line of code, to the changes that are affecting or participating in realizing these tickets and be able to add, if you have the skill, to add the comments there. Today with the AI uh, capability in GitLab uh, uh, platform, I can use AI features to even to generate unit tests to help me summarize my feedback and reviews. So again, AI has, has been added and enabled in GitLab to help each and every personnel across this whole life cycle in his journey in the software development. Cool. So what are the GitLab flow best practices? The website is there, but I really wanted to, to take you through a summarized uh, list of points for the best practices when you use GitLab flow. Some of them are uh, pretty clear. First one, use feature branches rather than direct commits, commits to the main branch. I think you all agree with me. A developer, use your own feature branch, have a, a draft merge request declared, tell everyone that you are working on a feature. People can still come and collaborate, but use your own feature branch because guess what? In GitLab, you don't have to merge into the main branch to do the testing. The testing capabilities, as I said, functions, and security testing are all available tools in your branch. Run every test on all commits. Actually, some tools may add extra licenses or extra restrictions on when you run several tests because it's an expensive exercise. In GitLab, we support that. This is what we ask people to do. Well, this is what we ask developers to do. Run tests as much as possible on each and every commit. Get the feedback and fix it immediately just in, in time. Perform code reviews before merging into the main branch. Actually, code reviews, I think it's a common practice today. I'm a developer, I do the changes, I submit that to someone, to my manager or my colleague to review my code. What's, what is different in GitLab is that I can define automated policies to add people to the review cycle of my code based not only on the functional test results, but also on the security test results. So now, if I run my security test and I found that there are newly introduced critical vulnerabilities, the tool automatically can bring in or invite the security experts, if you like, or security architects to have a look on that code change and give their explicit approval before accepting that code into the main branch. Now, there is no, there is nothing like I forgot to have the, my code reviewed by security because guess what? I can automate that process. Deployments are automatic based on branches and tags. Yes, and I will show you that in the demo. I can automate the execution of my deployments against each environment based on the assigned tags or the assigned branches. Tags are set by user, not by CI. Yes, not only they set by users, you should set rules on who can create tags, especially for tags that can automate the deployment to the production. Imagine that you have a rule that if someone adds a tag of prod or version point star 1.0, 1.2, then that deploy to production branch will be triggered automatically. You want to control that. Releases are based on tags, as I mentioned before. Yes, I have release branches, but the releases themselves, the uh, point in time code that I'm taking to deploy to the production are, or, or to release, especially if you are releasing code to the outside world, should be based on tags. Post commits are never rebased. 
post, post commits are, if there are anything wrong with that, you create a new feature branch, you do the change or hotfix if you like, you do the change and you, you push that back. You don't roll back or rebase post commits. Every one starts from the main and targets the main. This is important. And I show you how you can control that by creating protected branches. Developers should be only able to start or merge their or push their code into the main branch. So everyone should be starting from that main branch. And actually the developer should be creating a feature branch. They should do the development there and then before accepting or before pushing their code to be merged into the main branch. The propagation between the different environment and the release branches should be a very controlled process to, to make sure that my code or only healthy code being propagated to the production environment. Bug fixes in the main first and the release branches second. Yes, we do take, all of us have taken shortcuts before. I cannot deny that. Yes, there would be times where you want to apply something on the production branch and then you apply the same or the hotfix across the old branches. But this should not be the norm. The best practice or the norm or the rules should be, I am always starting from the main branch and doing my hotfixes there and then I am merging these changes across the different environment and release branches. Commit messages reflect intent. I think this is a very old advice, right? And I'm sure you would be laughing like me. How many times you did commit with, yes, I am committing a message, right? So please, and I'm telling you, I'm telling myself, I'm telling every single developer, please, when you do a commit, make that message reflect your intention of that commit, why you are doing the commit. Don't make it hello or hello world. Excellent. So the next one in our session now is what do we mean by protected variables and protected tags, branches and tags? Okay, so in GitLab, we have something called protected variables. And let me tell you something. In many cases, oh, actually in most of the cases, we have secrets, right? Imagine that you are deploying to a cloud environment and you have the access key or secret access key for that cloud environment. And then you have three different environments, testing, staging, and production. And usually the access, hopefully, the access and secret access key to, for each of these environments are different, right? How should I manage that these protected variables, the secrets, I'm just giving here an example for access key, but can be any, anything. How can I manage them and attach them to protected branches and environments? Basically, protected variables are securely passed to pop pipeline running on protected branches or protected tags. I can say that I, am, I have a protected variable that I want to be available only on protected branches. Easy. For example, developers, you have all the right to do the development on the main and feature branches. There are no secrets passed to these environments from GitLab. But once I start deploying a staging production or pre-production environments, these, I can declare these branches as protected in branches so that whenever a pipeline runs on these branches, automation pipeline, these variables will be passed. Now, the other thing here is protected branches and protected tags are, should be configured by the owner or maintainer of a given project. Now, the third thing here, which is very important, that I can't declare protected environments. Now, think of it this way, and I will come to the details in a second. But you have a protected branch. Let's not call it a staging branch. A branch is a branch. It's a copy of code, right? People can have access to that protected branch, like a team who have, was responsible for running the staging would have access to that branch who people who are managing the production would have access to the protect uh, protected pro production branch cool but inside that branch you would have i'm sure a job responsible to actually deploy to an actual environment 
So when I say environment, it is your actual environment you are deploying against. So in GitLab, you can define names or declare names for environment, just a, a name, right? And I and can they make that name or that that environment a protected environment and attach it to certain jobs, like the deploy job. And I'll show you that in, in a second in the demo. But the idea here is I want variables to not only be available to in branches, but I want them to only be available sometimes to certain environments, a job inside. And then I have the flexibility to control who has access to run the job. Yes, which means people may have access to merge into the production environment. Yes, a team can have access to merge into the production environment, but you want only one person to be able to run the deploy to production job, which is one of many jobs in that production environment pipeline, right? And this is where you say, that job is attached to a protected environment, and that environment, only these people, or one or many of roles, are able to run and access that, that job. If this is not clear enough, give me a second, I'll show you that to you in, sorry, in a minute, I'll show you that in, in the demo. Okay, now, this is a table I thought I would show you, show to you for, Controls for segregation of duty and, and features. So the list is protected branch and tag. I think we covered them in the previous slide. Merge request approval. This is again under the you define approval rules with a functional approvals. And remember in GitLab, you can also define security approval. Actually, you can automate them. Protected runners. So in short, for those who haven't used GitLab before, runners are the entities, the engines are responsible to pull CICD jobs and execute them. In many cases, for security reasons, I have seen that from customers, they say, my production job or my production br protected branch, I want it to only be executed on certain types of runners, isolated from runners from other uh, environments for security reasons. So yes, I can say, a protected branch only accessed by certain people and the protected branch only available to be executed. Actually, the jobs inside that branch can only be executed or pulled by protected runners. Protected variables is what I described in the previous slide. So basically, I have variables that are only available for protected branches and even I can assign them to environments so that only certain protected jobs can access them. Protected environments, this is what I described in the previous slide. So basically, I can reflect your environment. So here there are protected environment branches and there are protected environments. Branches reflect you, the branching you have, but that can also be uh, reflected into what we call the protected environments or environments in general. And usually the environment in GitLab is mapped to the deployment job inside your CICD uh, pipeline. And again, I'll show you that in the demo. <coughs> okay, now the last part in the presentation before I move into the demo. Time for what is the difference game? What is the difference between a release branch and a release tag? Release and the release. I intentionally added these slides because this can be a, a source of confusion for some people. Basically, I hope you can guess. A release branch are used for ongoing development and creating separate lines of work for different releases. While a release tag are used for creating unchanging references to specific point in history, such as release or other important comments. Basically, I am working on a release branch for release 14.2. This is an ongoing work. I'm adding code there in, with the, the aim that this is the code that I will at some point in time release to the outside world as my release 14, let's say. When I am done, when that point in time, when it comes, this is where I create a tag for that release, assign it to my release. And usually that tag, not usually, it will. The tag will 
be mapped to the to a comet in my release branch and this is the point in time which includes the code the if you like the packages everything related to that release this is the point in time this is what has been released in this 15. second what's the difference between environment branches i hope you can make the guess environment branches are as simply similar to the release branches. Environment branches are to maintain separate ongoing code development for different environments. Simply, I have pre-prod, testing, staging, production, or development environments, and this is where I have separate branch for each of these environments. Meanwhile, GitLab environments used to describe where code will be deployed. When protected, it dictates who can run the jobs, as I said in the previous slide, who can run jobs against the assigned environment. Variables can be assigned to appear on certain environments only. Environments in, in GitLab are just a name you give, and usually this is used to pro control who should be able to run certain jobs, and usually they are the deploy jobs in your pipeline. So that's the difference between environment branches and environments, and please, don't mix between them. Excellent. So this is all from the session, but let me show you some of these concepts in, in real life. This is my project here, right? And for those who haven't used, again, GitLab before, GitLab is structured as groups, subgroups, and projects, and you can create multiple subgroups. Okay. In my project, this is my source code, very straightforward. And then I have, I'll show you here, I have multiple branches. I have the main branch, as we agreed before, any features are created as a feature branch from the main branch. I run my code, I do the testing there, and then I push it to be merged into the main branch. And then I have a set of protect, protected branches. And let me open the editor. I think it's opened here already. So this is my GitLab comes with an integrated Visual Studio open source IDE. So I don't have even to install the IDE on my code. So here I have, I am sitting on the production. Let me go back to the main branch. Okay, I'll switch back to the main branch. So this is my pipeline file, by the way, in GitLab, these are jobs. And this is, the job structure is basically a stage. I want to run this job as part of which stage, and the stage is just a collection of jobs to be executed concurrently and I can control that and usually by default the jobs in the, the next stage will not start until the jobs in the previous stage finish but again I can customize that behavior but the point here the main point here is as you can see here I have three jobs in my pipeline testing deploy to staging and deploy to production and I have all of these different branches let me show you here this is very interesting I have these different four branches, testing, uh, main, staging, testing, production. So what I'm doing here is that I want to run the testing on any branch. So there are no really any rules in, uh, on the execution of, of my job. But then I have the deploy to staging job, which has this rule, which says basically I want to control the execution of this job only if I am running on the staging branch. So if I'm running on any other branch, it will not be executed. And this is a predefined environment variable from GitLab that enables me to, on the fly, get the name of the branch I am running against. Same thing applies to the deploy to production job. I want this job to be executed only against the production branch. Fair enough. Second thing is, here it comes the environment, my friends. Environment is just a name. I can name it whatever I want. But what I'm doing here is that I'm naming this job or attaching this job to the staging environment. And then I'm attaching this job to the production environment. So in GitLab, I can go, if I, once I add that, I can go under my operate here and environments, and I can see all of my defined environments, right? And I have testing in the testing branch. Also, I can come into the settings under CICD and under protected environments here, which is this one. 
and I can add rules to protect my environment. So what I'm doing here, I only define a protected environment for my production. So if imagine that I want to do something else, I can choose here the environment, let's say staging, and then I can select who are the users who are allowed to deploy. Basically, it's we are assuming that you are attaching this job to the deploy job in your pipeline, but you can't really attach that environment to any job in your pipeline. So who are the users who can deploy and who are the users who should approve? So in, as you can see here, I have this trick box checked. Allow pipeline triggerer to approve because it's only me. Usually in a team, you may allow people to execute the deploy to production job, but it will not be actually executed until other people comes also and approve that request. So this can be a two-step execution. Someone execute and someone else approve. Excellent. The other thing I want to show you as well in my pipeline is that it's this environment variable. You see this one here, I'm typing the same environment variable in both the deploy to staging and deploy to production. Actually, let me switch to the testing branch. Excellent. So you see here, I have the same environment variable in the deploy to the testing job. And also if I go into the staging, I have that environment variable defined here, right? But this time it is against the staging. Basically, at the first look, you would assume that it is the same exact name for the environment variable. So it would have the same value, right? But remember, I'm using environments. In GitLab, I can define secrets. If I go under CICD, if I go under variables here, I can define secrets or variables. As you can see, multiple times the same name. The difference here is in the environment attached to it. Production, in my case, I'm attaching the same variable with different value. Actually, in the production, I, the value is production. In the staging, as you would expect, the value is staging. And the same for everything else, it is just development, right? The other thing is, if I go here, see this checkbox? This is what we talked about before. Attaching an environment variable to a, or a protected environment variable to a protected branch. So if I check this one, this variable will never exist on anything other than the staging and production branches. Actually, let me, let's check together. What which branches are protected in our case? So if I go under repository and I go here under protected branches, like settings, repository and protected branches, this is that there is only the main branch. So actually I can add here the other branches either as a wildcard or by selecting them, I can say, okay, production environment is a pro protected environment and only maintainers are allowed to merge and only let's say developers and maintainers are allowed to push so so in this case i'm saying that this uh, production in branch is a protected branch again we started from the environment so basically i want to make this variable protected variable and be available on protected branches only and i've just shown you how to do protected branches before I actually, let's execute our pipeline and see how it goes. So if I go under build pipelines, and uh, let's do run pipeline. And this is from the main branch. So basically I'm running it. Okay. See which jobs have been executed, the build and test. There are no deploy to stage and no deploy to production simply because I'm using the rules here to control these jobs were to be executed. Now, if I go outside, I will go back under pipelines and run my pipeline again and go and run pipeline against production. This time, the execution is different. I have deployed production here executed. It will be very fast and it will run. So if I go back to my pipelines, I think the previous one I've already executed. Yes, done just now. And if we go under this one, you see these are the logs from this, this deployment. And 
basically this is a testing branch and it is executing uh, the testing i think in the build and this is a feature branch and this is the feature build now if i go under pipelines here okay it's blocked why because that deploy is a protected environment remember this production is a protected environment so it would require someone to approve to manually trigger and approve that deployment so this is the test to production and these are the, the logs and then I, if I click on this one because I had that checkbox to allow the trigger of the pipeline to approve I can come here and execute this job if I go inside it would tell me that I have to actually approve it so usually in real life the execute the triggerer of the pipeline and the approver are two different people in my case just me and and GitLab you can disable that and make them two people so if I go into my environments now I can see all of my in environments and I can come here and say either approve or reject I would approve it now I can run that job and here we go it is running before I conclude there's one last thing I want to show you which is very important the thing I did not show here the tags so basically we talked about before that you you use tags especially for releases for release tags <clears throat> and in GitLab, you can create tags either manually using the uh, git CLI, git tag, or simply I can go under the code here and create tags. And then I have here version 1.0 from the previous one. So I can come here and create a new tag, let's say version 1.1 for now. And I am creating that tag from that commit, from the existing, sorry, from that main branch. I can create the tag from any other branch, but let's create it from the production branch. Actually, if I go under pipelines here, if I go under pipeline, you will see that the pipeline have been, a pipeline have been executed. And this is a tag based pipeline, a tag triggered pipeline, as you can see here. And this is the value of our tag. And in GitLab, I can create a complete release just by going under deploy releases and here I can create a release from that tag let's say this one which would include all the milestones attached which will include a description for my release and it will also bring all the artifacts and I can attach release assets to my release so this is how you would create it excuse me a tag and yes you can again similar to what we did for protected branches i can do protected tags so that certain people are allowed to add tags with certain names and then you will use or you can use rules inside your jobs to execute certain jobs based on the assigned tags in that case you are controlling who has access to run uh, these jobs with these attached tags that concludes my session for today. I hope this was useful. I hope that was up to your expectations. Thank you very much for listening. Again, my name is Samara Koop. I'm a senior alliances and channels solutions architect with GitLab. Thank you very much.